passing this exam is a triumph so rare that only a select few have ever achieved it. Each year, around 10 million students pass China's notorious Gaokao. About 40,000 people each year pass the difficult US bar exam. But in the 27 years this exam was offered in its original form, only 43 students ever passed. It was an exam dreamed up by Russian physicist and Nobel laureate Lev Landau, and it was called the Theoretical Minimum. The point of this exam was simple, to determine if a student had what it takes to become a great theoretical physicist, and many of the students who passed it did. Some of the most successful passes include Isaac Pomeranchuk, who has several models in particle physics named after him, and Alexei Abrikosov, who won the Nobel Prize for Physics in 2003 for his contributions to the theory of superconductors. The name theoretical minimum comes from the fact that the exam was testing what Landau considered to be the minimum essential knowledge in theoretical physics needed to engage seriously with the field. Those who failed were considered to have gaps in their foundational knowledge. When I heard about this exam, I set out to find some examples of what questions were included because I wanted to know, one, what was in the exam? Two, why was it so hard? And three, was it really a good test of what it takes to make it in physics? Answering these questions starts with a look at the man who wrote the exam. If the name Lev Landau sounds familiar, it may be from a famous 10 volume series of textbooks called Course of Theoretical Physics that he and his student Eugenie Lefschitz wrote as a graduate level introduction to the entire world of physics. Between 1950 and 1980, the volumes were published on topics ranging from mechanics to field theory to quantum mechanics. Some of these were written while Lev Landau himself was in prison. Since Lefschitz mostly wrote the books and Landau dictated them, people have joked that the books contained not a word of Landau and not a thought of Lefschitz. Landau was a great physicist and is considered one of the last people to make fundamental contributions to all branches of physics. He lived right on the edge of time when it was still possible to do so. Any student who wanted to work with Landau had to pass his theoretical minimum exam, and this also applied to his future co-author. Liefschitz was actually the second student to pass the theoretical minimum and went on to help Landau run the exam for future students. In the late 1940s, one of those hopeful test takers was Boris Yoffe. Boris left behind a rare first-person account of what it was like to take the exam. When Boris arrived on Landau's doorstep with dreams of becoming a physicist, Landau was head of the theoretical division at the Institute for Physical Problems in Moscow. Over the course of two years, Landau administered 10 exams to Boris and fellow students. If Boris wanted to be a great physicist like Landau, he first had to prove he was worthy of such mentorship. Boris wrote, when students arrived at Landau's apartment to sit the exam, Landau would ask them to leave all their books, notes, etc. in the closet and invite them into a small room with a round table, with a few pages of blank paper on it and nothing else. Then Landau would formulate a problem and leave, but every 15 to 20 minutes he would reappear and look over one's shoulder. If Landau looked over your shoulder and stayed silent, that meant you were on the right track. If he said, Hmm, it was a bad sign. It meant you might be one of the students who failed his exam. Boris got the dreaded hmm during an exam on statistical mechanics. Then after 20 minutes, Landau came back and gave another hmm in an even more dissatisfied tone. Then Lifshitz, who was helping run the exam, looked at Boris's notes and shouted, Landau, do not waste time, throw him out. But Landau replied, let us give him another 20 minutes. In the end, Boris got the correct answer, having got there in an unexpected way. Landau approved and gave him a few more easy questions before letting him pass. Here's one of the problems that Boris solved during Landau's exam on macroscopic electrodynamics. 
A dielectric sphere with the electric and magnetic susceptibilities epsilon 1 and mu 1 is rotating with angular frequency omega in a constant electric field E in a medium characterized by parameters epsilon 2 and mu 2. The angle between the rotation axis and the direction of E is alpha. Find the electric and magnetic fields inside the sphere and in the medium. This question deals with boundary effects in electromagnetism and extends fundamental principles like Gauss's or Ampere's law into a complex scenario with movement and asymmetry. While Landau's exams were famously difficult, they each contained only two or three problems. Students would have about an hour to solve each problem, meaning they had to come very prepared with all the knowledge needed to dive deep into the problems. To practice, students who took Landau's exams would collect and share questions, but not answers, with each other. In some cases, questions compiled by students even showed up on future exams. We know this because Boris wrote, After a few examination sessions, I realized that Landau only had a limited number of problems. Sometimes he would give me the same problem which he had given another student. I gathered that Landau understood that his students would inform each other as to what problems had been given, but that did not worry him. To estimate the student's ability, it was enough for him to observe the process of the solution. Here are a few more examples of questions compiled by Landau's students for the exam on quantum mechanics. Problem 1. An oscillator of mass m and frequency omega is in a ground state. Suddenly, the frequency changes to omega dash. Find the probability of transition to an excited state. Problem 225. Find the width of the ground state level for a particle of mass m escaping from a hard spherical shell of radius r through a narrow hard channel of radius much smaller than r and a length much longer than r. Landau's textbooks were steadily released over the lifetime of the exam, and the problems given in the textbooks likely give a good idea of what was being tested in the exam. If you can do all of the more difficult problems in the textbooks, then you should have the foundational skills needed to pass. The theoretical minimum was hard because, like Landau, you had to be knowledgeable on all subjects within physics at a graduate level. As time goes on, this becomes harder to achieve, because every year there are new discoveries that update the framework of physics. Landau's textbooks contain what were at the time new ideas that had just been published, and the exam too was testing fresh ideas. This time period between the 30s and the 60s saw big changes in physics, like advances in nuclear physics, the invention of the transistor, which opened up the field of solid state physics, and the emergence of quantum field theory. Here is the reading list that students were expected to study for the quantum mechanics section of the exam. Most of these texts were in English or German, requiring Landau's Russian students to learn both foreign languages as well as the physics. But was the theoretical minimum a good test of what it takes to be a physicist? Well, of the 43 people who passed, I found that 16 of them had their own Wikipedia pages, and most of them appear to have made some notable contributions to physics. On a list of famous Russian physicists, many of them are either Landau's former students or can be traced back to him. We don't know who fell through the cracks and failed Landau's exam, but it does seem to have been a very effective way for Landau to select his students. In June 1949, Boris Ioffe finished his last exam and became the 13th student to pass the theoretical minimum. He went on to become a leading particle physicist. Successfully passing all 10 parts of the theoretical minimum not only gave students a prestigious place at the Landau School and on his list of pupils, but it also gave them access to his closed seminar. Boris says that in this seminar, Landau would assign students different papers published in journals like Physical Review to present to the class. Landau would strictly question students as they presented and would stop students who could not quickly and intelligently answer his questions about the papers. On occasion, these students were even kicked out of the group. 
Today, Landau's name is known for many achievements, including his exams, his textbooks, and his Nobel Prize. But what may be lesser known about him is that an arrest by Soviet police in 1938 almost made Landau's future work impossible. Landau's arrest was made during the end of a period of Soviet Union history called the Great Terror, during which Soviet dictator Joseph Stalin sought out political dissidents and had them either put into forced labor camps called gulags or executed. Along with several physicist colleagues, Landau was arrested for distributing an anti-Stalinist leaflet. Landau was also passionate about preserving the study of pure science in Soviet universities and rejected a new emphasis on military applications. While Landau was put in prison, several of his peers received much worse punishments or were executed. Niels Bohr, who had been an academic advisor to Landau during his visits to Europe, wrote letters to Stalin to advocate for the importance of Landau's release to the world of science. A case was also made by Russian physicist Pyotr Kapitsa, saying that he had made a discovery in the most puzzling field of modern physics and that no theorist other than Landau could explain it. Landau was released from prison in 1939, and a few months later did in fact make an important discovery in physics about the nature of superfluidity and phonons. This discovery would later win him the 1962 Nobel Prize. Landau made many discoveries in his career, although some he came to reluctantly. In his memories of Landau, Boris recalls an initial reluctance from Landau to accept ideas surrounding quantum electrodynamics. Students who attempted to present Feynman's papers on the subject at Landau's famous seminars were even thrown off the stage. In a conversation with a colleague, Landau exclaimed, if young people want to spend time on nothing, then let them do it. Yet, despite his protests, presentations of QED theories became more common at the Institute, and Landau would even peek in to observe the discussions. His curiosity evidently got the better of him, and in 1954, Landau made his own important contribution to QED in the form of Landau's pole, an energy scale at which the interaction strength of a quantum field becomes infinite. Sadly, Landau was injured badly in a car accident in 1961 and never fully recovered his scientific abilities before his death in 1968 at the age of 60. Before his death, Landau was able to see a school built in his honour by former students and colleagues called the Landau Institute for Theoretical Physics. This institute celebrated its 60th birthday this year and focuses on subjects near to Landau's heart, including condensed matter physics and quantum field theory. The institute also offers a modern version of Landau's theoretical minimum. The modern exams are still based largely on Landau's textbooks, with the relevant chapters listed here for each exam. Here are a couple of example problems from the math exam, which includes calculating an integral and solving a differential equation. The purpose of the exam is still to make sure you have mastered the basics. A look at the Institute's list of students who have passed parts of the modern theoretical minimum is pretty sparse. It looks like the modern exam is still no walk in the park, just as Landau would have wanted it. This video is made possible by my Patreon supporters. I'm really excited to have just received a new shipment of stickers in the mail with brand new designs relating to my channel. These stickers are to send out to new members who join the silver tier. I think these are the best stickers I've had available so far. As a silver patron, you get one of each sticker, plus a little note from me, and a special prize which I'm still waiting to receive a delivery of. This welcome package can be sent anywhere in the world and will travel to you from Australia. But I only have this many stickers, so if you want one, then consider signing up today. Thanks for watching. A special shout out to today's patron cat of the day, Gizmo.